morning. We're already at the end of February, the last day in February. Tomorrow will be March, St David's Day. And we're going to begin by reflecting on some words from a psalm, the Psalm 91. And it's actually a psalm that Satan goes on to quote uh, some of the later verses. I hope you'll join in with me. You should see it on the screen uh, as you're sharing in this service. So the psalmist says, Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High, whoever rests in the shadow of the Almighty, I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. And we're going to begin our service with a hymn that echoes that and reinforces it, a hymn about God's faithfulness. Let's pray together. 
Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. And Father, we say, lead us. Heavenly Father, lead us through this world's tempestuous sea. Guard us, guide us, keep us, feed us. You are our only help and plea. Here possessing every blessing, if our God our Father be. Saviour, by your grace restore us. All our weaknesses are plain. You've lived on earth before us. You have felt our grief and pain. Tempted, taunted, yet undaunted, from the depths you rose again. And Lord Jesus Christ, as we share with you in the struggle of your temptations, we pray that we may gain insight about ourselves, strength to cope with all the wiles of the evil one, and a willingness to journey with you in good times and in bad. And we ask this for the glory of your name. Amen. And I want to read the same passage that we had last time. I uh, hope you don't mind that, but it's a great passage to share in. And as I pointed out, a huge privilege that we are allowed to enter into the deepest part of Jesus' struggles. So here we are, Luke chapter 4, verses 1 to 13. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the desert where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone. The devil led him up to a high place, and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor, for it's been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. So, if you worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered, it says, do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. Last week, you may remember, we uh, thought about the beginning of this passage about the temptations. We thought about where Jesus had come from, filled with the Holy Spirit at his baptism. And then we thought a bit more deeply about what it means to fast, and especially to fast for 40 days. And then how Jesus dealt with the enemy, with de the devil, with Satan. How he used scripture as a shield of faith and the sword of the Spirit to defend himself, uh, to help discern what was really going on 
in the tempter's words and so protect himself and ultimately all of us from falling into temptation so that we could be forgiven. Well this week, in a moment, we're going to be thinking about the temptation that uh, Luke lists last. You'll find it's actually the middle one with Matthew's account, but that doesn't really matter. How he led him to Jerusalem and challenged him to throw himself off from the highest pinnacle there. But before we do that, we're going to have another song, King of Kings, a great song it is too.
a wonderful song which reminds us of many of the qualities of Jesus that we need as we journey through life. And I've reminded you how it is that Satan presents himself as an angel of light, using the Bible as his own attempt to undermine uh, Jesus' commitment to God. Jesus also said that the enemy was like a shepherd, not the true shepherd, but a false shepherd, a shepherd in disguise. And we have to be aware that often Satan's wiles, guiles, can come to us from very unexpected places and even very unexpected people. So we have to really learn to be alert. On one occasion, Jesus was to find that Peter, his most trusted disciple, so to speak, became the source that Satan used to try and lure him away, to lure him away from the path of sacrifice that was going to lead from Caesarea Philippi all the way to the cross. And we can see him trying to do similar things in the story that we focus on today. Let me read it to you again. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that they will, you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered, it says, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Now it strikes me that there's something very intriguing about the three different stories that Jesus told or let us into his temptation experience. And that with each of them there is something which is kind of a human element and there is something which is more of a divine element. Something which tempts him because of his humanity and something which tempts him because of his divinity. And uh, I want to begin with what I think was the, the humanity part of his testing in this encounter when he was whisked, whether in imagination or in reality, to the highest pinnacle in the Temple of Jerusalem, I don't think matters one iota. In his mind, that's where he stood. And I want to begin in perhaps a rather strange way. As I was coming into the church today, uh, there was a man with a big, with a camera with a big lens and I was talking to him and said, what did he like to photograph? And he said he liked to photograph birds. And birds are really fascinating, aren't they? Uh, we all enjoy looking at them, whether it's uh, the blue tit pecking away at the peanuts, or swans gliding, apparently effortless, but making quite a noise sometimes as they move into their migration, in formation, going to, to fly so many miles. Or maybe what attracts you is uh, a seagull, you don't have to go to the sea, at least you don't in Coventry to see them. You can see them swooping around and calling to one another. But one of the most magnificent birds, I think, is the eagle. There it is, sitting on its nest in a crag high up in the rocks. Opens its great wings, sweeps across the sky, and when appropriate it can dive to the floor falling many tens, perhaps hundreds of feet, to grasp its prey. What strength, what beauty, what amazing power it has. The gift of flight. But it's not only the eagle, even the common sparrow can fly. And so it can do something that we can't. And yet I think there's always been a longing in human beings to be able to fly. It's one of the dreams that seems to be locked inside us. And that dream has driven people. There's the story in Greek mythology about Icarus, the man who tried to escape from a high tower by forming feathers with wax to make wings. But when he jumped out of the tower, the wax melted because he was too much in the sun and he fell to his death. But there it is, even in Greek mythology, this longing that we should be able to fly. Somehow it's a symbol for human beings of being completely free, of being able to go where we want. And it, it drove the Wright brothers to make those flimsy 
machines that could only just get off the ground and it drove us to build fantastic hotels in the air that transport us from one continent to the other. The dream of flying is a symbol of human freedom. And Satan locked into this dream in human hearts when he took Jesus to the temple in Jerusalem. Now scholars disagree about uh, the height. Some people say, well, where he was standing was the southeast corner overlooking the Kedron. And some say that was 300 feet to the bottom. Some say it was 450 feet. But what's 150 feet when you're jumping anyway? And this was the kind of temptation that pulled at Jesus to leap from there into the temple precinct. If he was the Son of God, why couldn't he do that? As a human being, he had that longing to show the freedom that was his. And there were these verses in the Bible that Satan quoted about if, if we jumped, he would give his angels charge over us and we wouldn't dash our foot against a stone. It would have been a sensational act, wouldn't it, for Jesus to jump right into perhaps the court of the Gentiles where everybody could see his amazing prowess. So what's wrong with that? Well, the problem is, if you try and draw a crowd to gain their astonishment and respect with sensational activities like that, you have to do more and more. At one time, we were amazed that we could put someone into orbit around the Earth. And then we were amazed that we could land somebody on the moon. But now these things kind of feel really commonplace. And we only get a little bit excited when we can land a machine on Mars to take samples and send photos back. If you depend on sensational activity to gain a crowd of followers, you have to build it up and build it up and build it up. Think about all the comic heroes. Superman, Spider-Man, Batman, and the whole host that have followed since. They have to get more incredible in the things they are able to perform in order to impress us. And Jesus knew that although he could have done that, it was the wrong way because God had not chosen him to control people, but to change people. He had not called him to be a five-minute sensation, but somebody to serve. He had not called him to do amazing things, but to lay down his life in sacrifice. It would have been so much easier to jump from the temple and make people astonished, but it would have failed because God wasn't into sensations, he was into changing people's hearts deep, deep within. And Jesus knew that just to perform miracles for the sake of miracles would mislead people. And he would be tempted, he would be tested, he would be encouraged by the crowds to do amazing things, to prove who he was. But right here he nailed that temptation of human beings to draw attention to themselves by doing amazing things because he knew in his heart that that would betray God. But what about the divine side of this temptation? In the Old Testament, almost at the very end, is a book called Malachi. It's the very last of those prophets, those small books of prophecy that follow Isaiah, Jeremiah and Ezekiel. And in chapter 3 of Malachi, it says this, See, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly 
The Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. Well, John the Baptist had come and claimed he'd come to prepare the way for the Lord. And this passage goes on to say, then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. What a way to suddenly come to the temple. If Jesus had projected himself from that highest point down into the temple, people would have said, it's the Messiah, it's the promised one, it's the one of whom Malachi said, it's the Lord suddenly coming to his temple. What's wrong with that? One day Jesus would go to the temple. But he would go not to impress people with his fantastic abilities. He would go to unshadow the problems that were going on in the temple. And that's why what Malachi goes on to say, that this Lord, this visitor to the temple, will come near. And he will testify against those who oppress the widows and the fatherless, who defraud labourers of their wages and deprive aliens of justice. And that's exactly what Jesus did when he did come to the temple. And it was that which sealed his death. It was as though he'd signed his own death warrant when he disturbed those who were making money out of the temple, those who were defrauding the poor oppressing the widows, and so on. Jesus would come to his temple, but not in a fantastic show of amazing miracle, but to challenge the authorities about the rottenness of what they were doing. But it was a temptation for Jesus. Put into his heart and mind by the evil one, to take the easy path. Why go the path of suffering when you can prove you are the Messiah by leaping into the temple and being the Lord who suddenly comes to the temple. That won't be a temptation for us in itself, but the temptation to take the easy way, to avoid the cost of discipleship, is one that comes to most of us. And for those of us who have the privilege of standing in a church and ministering to a congregation or a great conferences, there is the temptation that Jesus had of drawing attention to yourself by a great performance. That is not the way of God. So we need to be thankful that Jesus discerned in Satan's ploy an attempt to get him to break his trust. You see, what Satan was really saying when he quoted those scriptures was, prove to me that you do trust God. Go on, prove to me that you do trust God. But the very moment we have to prove it shows we doubt it. And so Jesus had to withstand that. Sometimes a child will say to the, his parents, well, if you love me, you would buy me that, or you would let me do that. And we know that love, true love, will not give in to that kind of language, that kind of approach, because true love values the child and doesn't surrender uh, to their, their ploy. And so it was with Jesus that he had to withstand the tempter's ploy to say, prove that you trust God. Show me, establish it. Don't let me doubt it anymore. Prove it to me. But Jesus knew the moment he tried to do it in this amazing way, he would be doubting God and he would also be denying the reality of those scriptures. Because the scriptures Satan chose began as we did by saying, if you shelter in the Most High, if you rest 
in the Almighty. You will find his protection. But it's interesting what happened a little later. In chapter 4, it says, Jesus returned to Galilee and the power of the Spirit and the news about him spread throughout the whole countryside. And he goes to Nazareth and preaches his sermon. To start with, people are very enthusiastic. And they say, who is this who's saying all of this? And then something went wrong. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove Jesus out of the town, and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him down the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. And what was it that Psalm 91 went on to say? Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honour him. And that was what God actually did. He set his seal on the commitment and the trust of Jesus. And when it was a situation which really required it, he saved him. There would come a time when Jesus would need to go even deeper in his trust. There would come a time when nailed to the cross, he would cry, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But he placed his trust even then. In God. He didn't try and come down from the cross. He didn't call legions of angels to defend him. He entrusted his dying breath into his father's care and the resurrection would follow. Satan will try all manner of things to lead us astray. We need to stand with Jesus to see that at the heart of our Christian life is a commitment to trust God in good days and in bad. Because if we shelter in the wings of the Most High, we will be safe. Safe ultimately in God's eternity. Before we have our closing song, we're going to pray, and I feel it's appropriate that on sometimes we should pray for the Baptist Missionary Society. And the week we've just had, they've asked us to pray for some of the toughest places where they're working. So I invite you, as we remember how Jesus went through these really, really tough times, and it was part of God's plan that he should grow in his resilience through that, because he would face really tough times. It's right we should pray for our brothers and sisters, part of our Baptist Missionary Society, who are in really tough places. And we begin by praying for the church in Lebanon, where the BMS are helping out, that they may be able to continue to serve vulnerable people, some who were harmed and left economically deprived because of the disaster that happened there. Some are Syrian refugees who have fled. Let's pray for the church and BMS personnel and resources who are helping to show Christ's love in that difficult situation. And then you might remember that Greek island of Lesbos where there was a very serious fire uh, which uh, gutted a major refugee centre there, the Moria refugee camp. And there are BMS support workers there, Danielle and Rodriga, seeking to help that refugee community. And so we pray for them, uh, that when the going is really tough, 
uh, they will remember that God is with them. And we pray that when they wonder where their resources are going to come from, God, as he has promised, will provide. And we pray that in that difficult situation, they will be able to still show the sacrificial love of a God who cares. And finally, we pray for the BMS's work in Afghanistan. We've learnt a little bit about this over the last 18 months or so, especially how they've been helping pregnant mothers care for their babies more adequately and avoid some of the pitfalls of the uh, traditional ways of giving birth and so forth. And we pray for all those who are going around Afghanistan showing women how best to care for themselves and go through the birth process and to care for their newborn. Lord, we thank you that with love and care and attention, people can learn better ways. And we thank you for the work of the BMS and those who work with them to bring health care to many of the women in Afghanistan. We pray that many lives will be saved, both the babies and the mothers, and that they will be able to grow up into healthy human beings who discover the fullness of life in Jesus. And so we pray for ourselves, for those of us who are going through tough times, who have close relatives who are seriously ill, who have people we know, friends and neighbours, struggling with anxiety, or perhaps ourselves. And we pray for one another that in these times we might know we have a saviour who doesn't perform tremendous miracles, but does share our suffering and can bring us through the hardest of times. So Lord, surround us with your amazing sacrificial love that you've made clear to us in Jesus Christ our Lord. Please hear our prayers in his name. And so, we remember that in the end it's God who reigns. We're going to sing, over all the earth, Lord, reign in me.
So we pray, Saviour, by your grace restore us. All our weaknesses are plain. You have lived on earth before us. You felt our grief and pain. Tempted, taunted, yet undaunted from the depths, you rose again. Spirit of our God descending, fill our hearts with holy peace. Love with every passion blending, pleasure that can never cease. Thus provided, pardoned, guided, ever shall our joy increase. Father, we thank you that because of all Jesus went through, we have someone who understands us, and so we can approach his throne of grace in our time of need and find mercy and help. Thank you for this truth. Help us to discover more of its reality as we journey through this week and the rest of Lent. And now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.